Okay. You ready, Harold? Okay. Um, Christ Object Lessons, page 127, says this. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to that generation, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are essential. New truth is not independent of old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded them to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes a lifeless form. Please think about the fact that what we're sharing about Islam, what we're sharing about the reform movements and their repetition is based upon the foundational understandings of Adventism. It may be the first time you've heard some of these things. It may be what you would call new light but it's in agreement with the old light. And that's what new light would do. It would agree with the old. Um, I'm going to read a quote from A.T. Jones and a quote from Uriah Smith. Just to express the pioneer understanding, understanding of the seven trumpets of Revelation. This is from Biblical Institute uh, by Uriah Smith. Page 260 says, the political events of this dispensation are properly symbolized by trumpets, those heralds of war and revolution. These are brought to view in the 8th, 9th, and a part of the 11th chapter of Revelation. In Thoughts of, on Daniel and Revelation by Smith, on page 431, speaking about the trumpets, he says, a trumpet is a symbol of war. A.T. Jones in Ecclesiastical Empire, page 7, says, The seven trumpets aptly enter here because the trumpet is the symbol of war. So, if we are to maintain the pioneer understanding of the seven trumpets, they understand that the first four trumpets represented the historical warfare, the historical providences that brought down Western Rome by 476. And they also understood that the fifth and sixth trumpet represented the warfare that was brought by Islam. For us, as we did in our last presentation, to identify that the prophecy of the descendants of Ishmael was that their hand would be against every man and every man's hand would be against them is consistent with the symbols of the trumpets if you maintain the pioneer understanding. The pioneers under, uh, identified that the fifth and sixth trumpet was the warfare that was brought by Islam. And what I'm suggesting is that when Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19, is giving a description of the seventh trumpet, the third woe, that in verse 18, I believe, where it says the angering of the nations, that the angering of the nations is the warfare that is produced by Islam in connection with its symbolic work of being the symbol of the seventh trumpet, the third woe. And to suggest that is consistent with not only how the pioneers identified Islam in Bible prophecy, but how they identified the trumpets of Bible prophecy. Um, in terms of the angering of the nations, we, we read from early writings, 36, where Sister White saw, said that the angering of the nations comes before the wrath of God, so it takes place um, before human probation closes. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 221, she says, We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. 
prophecies are fulfilling, strange and eventful history is being recorded in the books of heaven, events which it was declared should shortly precede the great day of God. Everything in the world is in an unsettled state. The nations are angry, and great preparations for war are being made. So when she's talking about the angels, or the, 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 the nations being angry, she's associating it with the preparation of war. The angry of the nations is the warfare that takes place in the third woe. And consistent with the triple application of prophecy at a very simple, basic level, if the first woe was Islam and the second woe was Islam, then the third woe is going to be Islam. It's identifying the warfare that's brought by Islam at the end of the world. Now, I was talking to a brother up here in between the break, and we got to a point that I probably should should restate for everyone. I understand that some of these things are very difficult to, to follow the first time through. Uh, I, I believe that anyway. Um, when I said that I had a, that I personally had determined that the, the second well, the sixth trumpet didn't end in 1840, it had to end in 1844. The reason for that is I had already understood triple applications of prophecy, and I realized that the first and second woe, the characteristics of the first and second woe, are what, are, are what will identify the characteristics of the third woe. So for me, in both those woes, in the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet, you have two representations, two histories represented. In verse 4 of Revelation 9, you have a command not to hurt those that have the seal of God. Well, that is a reference to the sealing of the 144,000. Even though it had a fulfillment in past history, it's pointing forward to the sealing of the 144,000. We've, we've agreed to this over and over again this week. All the prophetic testimony is pointing to the end of the world. So in verse 4 of Revelation 9, when it says, Hurt not those that have the seal of God, that has some kind of, some kind of fulfillment at the end of the world. And we know what the seal of God is at the end of the world. It's the sealing of the 144,000. It's the Sunday law of testing time. So in the first woe, you have two histories. You have the history that's representing the sealing of the 144,000, and you have the history of Islam's warfare. And correctly understood, in the second woe, you have two histories. You have the warfare of the 391-year prophecy, and then you have the sealing that is represented from 1840 to 1844. Um, let me read this. I have re referred to this several times. But let me put this in the record from Great Controversy 611. She's going to start the first sentence. She's going to be identifying this angel here. The angel of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 that comes down out of heaven and light, lightens the earth with his glory. That's where Sister White's going to start in this paragraph. She's going to refer to this angel. And then in the next sentence, in the next sentence, She's going to refer to this history, 1840 to 1844. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that this angel of Revelation 18, that's the latter rain sealing angel. When that angel joins the third angel's message, we've reached the sealing time. So she's going to make a comparison with this angel and this history. And then she's going to add one more line of history on it. She's going to line, line the history of Pentecost. So says this, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of a worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a, a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century, but these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. And then she says, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. And she talks about Pentecost, and the next paragraph she says, the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Here are the times of refreshing, 
to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of threshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Sister White is being very clear here that when this angel comes down and joins the third angel's message and the Bible says, Surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. And brothers and sisters, in these reform movements, we, we showed that in these reform movements, when a divine symbol comes down, it's identifying when the message is in power and when a testing process begins. The angel of Revelation 10 comes down in 1840. Michael comes down and deals with Cyrus in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The dove comes down and lands on Christ at the baptism. In Moses, Christ came down at the test of circumcision. When Sister White is referring to this, this here, she's comparing it to Pentecost. She's identifying it with the latter rain, and she's comparing it with the history of 1840 to 1844. Therefore, in the first woe, you have a history of Islam's warfare, verses 5 through 12, and you have a history of the sealing, hurt not those that have the seal of God, in verse 4. And in the second woe, you have a history of Islam's warfare in the 391-year prophecy, and then you have the history of the sealing of God's people in 1840 to 1844. Therefore, these two woes are telling us that the third woe will have two histories. And that's why the pioneers correctly identify that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22, 1844. And verse 7 of Revelation 10 says it's during the sounding, in the days, it says. And the way it expresses is in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it's, it's conveying a progressive history. In those days, the mystery of God should be finished. And the trumpet is representing the work that is Christ is doing in the most holy place to finish the investigative judgment. This is where the mystery of God will be completed. But the woe aspect, the work of Islam, what Christ is doing in the most holy place from 1844 onward has been pre prefigured with this history of 1840 to 1844 and prefigured in verse 4, hurting up those that have the seal of God. Because what Christ is doing in the most holy place is he's determining who he can put the seal of God upon. You follow the, the, the connection, that's the comparison that Sister White's making about these histories. So the seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpet and the third bow are the same. But the seventh trumpet is identifying the work of Christ in investigative judgment. The third bow is identifying the warfare of the trumpet of Islam in the third bow. And we're suggesting that it begins on September 11, 2001. Great Controversy 439. <clears throat> Sister White says, winds are a symbol of strife. Um, Manuscript Releases, volume 18, page 177. Soon the four winds of heaven will be loosed, and in every part of the globe there will be dissension, strife, war, and bloodshed. So I, I, I do not deny there are quotes in the spirit of prophecy. I don't have, have a problem understanding this. The winds of strife include the natural disasters. It, it includes all these cataclysmic end time events. But the winds of strife primarily are talking about the warfare that takes place in the last days. And Maranatha, page 297, says, In the last scenes of verse history, wars will rage. So let me read you something here. Um, it, this is one of those that it's better if you had the quote in front of you. It's, it's in the back of early writings. Sister White had said something in early writings, and then you know in the back um, she comments on some of her statements. And so she's going to comment on a statement that she made in page, on page 33 in early writings. And we want to read her comments, and you find this in early writings, page 85. Okay, and here, here's what she says. On page 33 is given the following. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. I saw that God had children who do not keep and Sabbath, do not see and keep the Sabbath. 
they have not rejected the light upon it. At the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost and went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. Now she's going to comment on that statement that's found on page 33. <clears throat> and and if, you, if you just deal with that comment, you're not familiar with it, she's identifying what we call in Adventism the little time of trouble. And never, Sister White never called it the little time of trouble. It's, it's a term that we use in Adventism that is, is correct, but she never called it. But the little time of trouble begins at the Sunday law in the United States and continues and escalates, gets worse, until Michael stands up and then the great time of trouble begins. The little time of trouble is the Sunday law testing time. And but moving on to her comments dealing with the angry of the nation. She says, this view was given in 1847 when there were but very few of the Advent brethren observing Sabbath. And of these, but few supposed that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is being seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. Brothers and sisters, Amen. catch that last Amen. phrase. That's a key. The nations will be angry, but held in check. Okay? Because that's what we're, what we're saying here. I want you to see it. Is that the angering of the nations began on September 11, 2001, and George Bush immediately went to the world and said, we're now in a worldwide war with terrorism, and there was a restraint placed upon Islam as we went into Iraq and, Ava and Afghanistan and began shutting down bank accounts and all the things that have been done. They're being restrained. Now, why? Why am I saying that? Here's why I'm saying that. These reform movements, brothers and sisters, and we're getting right down to where the rubber hits the road on this presentation. These reform movements illustrate that the Millerite history is going to be parallel to the history of the development of the 144,000. And in the Millerite history, when Miller's message was empowered on August 11, 1840, when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down with a little book open in his hand, and he put one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea, Sister White says the fact that he put his feet upon the land and sea, it represents a worldwide message. And we just read from Great Controversy 611, then in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. Christ came down on August 11, 1840, and he confirmed the year-day principle of Bible prophecy that the Millerites were using, and therefore he empowered the message at that point. But what happened to empower? What happened to empower is this. There had been a time prophecy in Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15. We read it in our last presentation. <clears throat> there were four angels. Not three, not five. There were four angels that would bring warfare against Egypt, against Europe, for 391 years and 15 days. They were let loose. That's what it says. They were let loose. They've been prepared for an hour, day, month, and a year. Uh, verse 14 of Revelation 9 says, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels. And they were loose to bring warfare for 391 years and 15 days. And therefore, prophetically, when that time prophecy concluded, those angels were restrained. If they were loosed at the beginning to bring warfare for 391 years, when it concludes prophetically, those angels are restrained. You see my point? That's just one part of the argument. Prophetically, at the prophetic level, if they were loosed, in 1449, then in 1840, they're restrained. But in reality, in reality, what fulfilled this prophet, prophecy is when the four great European powers came together to decide the fate of Islam. They saw that Egypt was attempting to reestablish an Islamic dynasty 
by taking control of Turkey's navy and, and claiming to be the, the new dynasty in Islam, and they were going to carry on the jihad. And the four great European powers came together to decide the fate of Islam, and the last ruler of the Ottoman Empire surrendered his national sovereignty into their hands. And at that point, the Europeans told Egypt, you either back off or we're coming in and we're going to clean your clock. And they backed off. There was truly a historical restraint placed upon Islam. It's not just in the prophecy. They were loosed at the beginning of the time prophecy and then at the prophetic level when the time prophecy concludes there's a restraint. In history, Islam was restrained. And it was restrained by the four great European powers. So what we're saying is that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. And then no matter who you think blew up the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, it's easy to go and get the evidence that from that point on, the United States went to the world and put a restraint on Islam. And we're saying this history parallels this history, which is in agreement with all these other histories. And we're saying that the number four in Bible prophecy represents what? Worldwide. Worldwide. So when the four great European powers put a restraint on Islam on August 11, 1840, they were pointing forward to the time when George Bush went to the United Nations and says we're now in a worldwide war with terrorism and a restraint was put upon Islam. And the third woe arrived in history. And the third woe is marking when the angel comes down and not only empowers the message, but it marks the beginning of the latter rain. And let me finish reading this quote by Sister White from Early Writings, page 85. She says, The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall be begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth, and nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. What I'm saying is, is the restraint is marked in history on September 11, 2001. Do you follow the logic even if you don't accept it? You follow the logic. Now notice what she said. She says, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. And at that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Amen. When Islam is restrained, the latter rain begins to fall. And Islam was restrained on September 11, 2001. And in Adventism, because we've been sleeping very heavily in the Laodicean condition, those of us that have studied <coughs> anything about the latter rain have usually concluded that the latter rain doesn't fall until the Sunday law. But that isn't correct. Inspiration is clear that the latter rain begins to sprinkle before the Sunday law. And brothers and sisters, inspiration is also clear. What, what page did you read? Uh, page 85 of early writing. Inspiration is also clear that when the latter rain begins to fall, we are required to recognize it. Let me, let me read you a couple of quotes. Testimonies to Ministers, page 507. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, there's a time when the latter rain begins to fall, when the wheat and tares are still together. According to Daniel 12, 
when the wise and wicked are still together, according to the parable of the ten virgins, when the wise and foolish virgins are still together. The latter rain begins to sprinkle. The wise are receiving it. They're recognizing it. How do you recognize the latter rain? But the foolish, the wicked, they don't recognize it. There's a, there's a quote here from Testimonies to Ministers, page 300, where Sister White, where the editors, someone blocks out the city or the church that she's speaking of. Let me put the cold in here. <clears throat> Unless those who can help in Colton are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. What was the quote? That's Testimonies to Ministers, page 300. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will not always who will always want to control the work of God to dictate even what movement shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. She's talking about right here. And she says, there will be those among us that do not recognize that work when it goes forward. That's what she said. Brothers and sisters, in Adventism, where has the latter end been illustrated in Adventism. In the history of Adventism, you mean? In the history of Adventism. Wasn't it illustrated in Minneapolis in 1850? <coughs> How many of the leaders, that was the, the Minneapolis General Conference, that was the leadership, it wasn't a bunch of lay people. How many of the leadership recognized what took place there as the latter rain? No. Sister White recognized. Well, Jones and Wagner. But you know, the ones that, the ones that were at the 99% didn't recognize it. Didn't recognize it. So recognize Do we believe that's an illustration of the latter rain? Sister White's clear, brothers and sisters. That's an illustration. And she talks a great deal about why it was rejected. You know, the main reason she, she sets for it, she says, an unwillingness to set aside preconceived and a large part contributed to the rejection of Jones and Wagner's message, which was the latter rain message. And one of the reasons that history took place is for you and I here at the end of the world when it's being repeated before our very eyes. And we need to shake ourselves and remember that Sister White says when it comes to in, in the investigation of Bible truth, we're supposed to set aside our preconceived opinions at the door of investigation. That's what she yeah. said. Brothers and sisters, what you've been hearing this week, it's getting nailed down from so many different areas in God's Word that I hope the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart that we are in that time period. Because that's what He's saying to me over and over again. And I know some, I know some when, when you get to this point in the study where you start trying to pull the trigger on some of these ideas, some people will say, well, I know people that have been in this message, but I don't see any changed lives, brothers and sisters. The reform movement of Elijah is prefiguring this time. Elijah was a prophet, was he not? How many people did he see that had changed lives? Well, himself. How many were there? 7,000. 7,000. <coughs> this isn't any time to be looking at human beings to be looking at the Word of God and seeing what this message is so. Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 142. Well now, how are we going to know anything about that message if we're not in a position to recognize anything of the light of heaven when it comes to us? And we will just as soon pick up the darkest deception when it comes to us from somebody that agrees with us when we have not one particle of evidence that the Spirit of God has sent them. Christ said, I come in the name of my Father, but you will not receive me. 
Now that is just the work that's been going on here ever since the meeting at Minneapolis. Because God sends a message in His name that does not agree with your ideas, therefore you conclude it cannot be a message from <coughs> God. Brothers and sisters, when this time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days came to a conclusion, four angels were restrained. Four angels were restrained. We know that when the sealing of the 144,000 takes place, that four winds are going to be restrained. If you understand that from Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3, say amen. amen. And in Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3, brothers and sisters, I would challenge you to identify a horse. It isn't there. There is no horse in those verses. But this is what Sister White says. We've read it before. I want to put it in the record again. Selected Messages, book 3, page 409. Angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth bearing destruction and death in its path. The four winds that are restrained when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and the sealing of the 144,000 begin. Those four winds are represented as an angry horse that brings destruction. The pioneers on both those charts that have been endorsed by the Lord, when they symbolically represent Islam on both those charts, they use the war horse as a symbol of Islam. Islam, the restraint of Islam marking the beginning of the third bow and the beginning of the sprinkling of the latter rain took place about seven years ago and God's people are sleeping on but this message is going forward shall we pray Father, we wish to understand the time in which we live, and we know that you've promised to speak through us through your prophetic word, and we thank you for the light that you've given to us here this week. We wish to be empowered with understanding that we can convey this message to those around us. We wish for your Holy Spirit to go with it, and we know that your Holy Spirit can't work with us if we're still holding on to idols and sin in our life. We need that work of cleansing to take place in our hearts and our minds so that we can begin this work. We can tell by what's going on on planet Earth, probation's about to close. That fact demands that you speak to us through your prophetic word as you've always done. And we thank you for the light that you're unfolding that you're now sweeping away the, the rubbish that's been hiding the foundation of truths that give us the key to understand these things in the book of Revelation that you're opening at this time. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.